Hey everyone, just so you know, this is the final installment of a three-part series on Kelp Worlds. If you're just tuning in, we'd like to encourage you to listen to parts one and two first. Everything will make a lot more sense that way. And if you're trapped inside your home in response to this coronavirus, we're thinking about you right now, and we're about to transport you far, far away. Unless, of course, you live on Haida Gwaii. Anyhow, here's the third and final installment of our series on Kelp Worlds. You are listening to Season 2 of Future Ecologies. Hey, this is Adam. And Mendel. And if you've made it this far to Episode 3 of our series on Kelp Worlds, uh, congratulations, you are officially a nerd like us, <laughs> and, and thanks for listening. Um, to wrap this series up, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to take you on a field trip. Specifically, we're taking you to Haida Gwaii, a rugged island archipelago about 60 kilometers. That's 40 miles. Off the north coast of British Columbia and southeastern Alaska. About 4,500 people called these islands home, and nearly half of these belong to the Haida Nation, including Kiljus. Barbara Wilson, who you heard in our last episode. So an archipelago is basically a collection of islands, and Haida Gwaii consists of about 150, ranging from these tiny little outcrops where rare seabirds like to nest, to majestic mountainous Moresby in the south and beautiful boggy Graham in the north. It's surrounded by some of the most productive and diverse nearshore marine communities in the North Pacific. And we've come here because This is an archipelago from which sea otters were extirpated during the fur trade, and where they have not yet returned. But, in all likelihood, that's about to change. It's only a matter of time. Along the way, we're going to eat some gudingai, visit a floating laboratory, talk to a living Haida legend, and finally meet the star of this series. And, spoiler alert, it's not the sea otter. They're actually the fastest snail in the West. <laughs> I like to tell people that little fun fact. Dubious a, distinction. Yeah, dubious distinction. But they do move quite fast when they're running away from predators. Oh, this guy's really performing. This is awesome. But before you slip into your wetsuit and grab your snorkel, we've got some climbing to do. We're on a mission to find a rare plant, and we've enlisted some local guides to help us out. We're going to have a kind of not so interesting slog for a bit as we get through this clear cut. Okay. And then there'll be more stuff. This is Stu. Um, I'm Stu Crawford. I live in Haida uh, I work for the Haida Nation as a marine biologist. And uh, I like lichens and plants and such as well. We're on the trail up Sleeping Beauty Mountain. <laughs> And this is Jen. My name is Jen Chow. I'm a resident of Haida Gwaii. I work as a registered nurse. I'm a yoga teacher. I'm a mom. I'm Stu's wife. I like being outside. And this is Yarrow. Hi, this is Yarrow. Yeah, she's 21 months old. Do you want to say hi? You say hi, everyone. Hey, everyone. And if you're wondering why we're following a marine biologist and his family up Sleeping Beauty Mountain to look for a rare plant. Well, this is just kind of what happens when you travel with Adam. That is true. I I promise, though, when we get to the top, you'll have a clearer view. And while we are supposed to be looking for a plant, we're spending an awful lot of time on the way up, stopping to examine and sample just about everything else. I mean, we break for slime molds. Serratia mixa, fruticulosa, variety paroides. Have you seen this before? And we break for lichens. Mm. Do you want to see devil's matchstick? What's the deal with all these names? Fairy puke, devil's matchsticks. Lichenologists have, are good at naming things. Huh? And mushrooms. <laughs> Does anyone want to touch a goofy mushroom? Oh, yes, Yarrow, look. It's, goofy oh, mushroom. Oh, oh, eyeball, eyeball. Careful, eyeball. It's visit as heck. Uh, and yes, even millipedes. What kind of millipedes are those? The Haida name is Ukkungi. Basically, it translates as eagle bug. It's a medicinal creature. You eat them, Jack Tryman? Whoa. Yes. Okay, so I pulled the ends off and now I suck on this bit. Yeah. 
Because so, you're sucking out the guts. Do you, does it matter which end you start at? I don't think so. Because it's detached in both ends now. It tastes a bit like um, like a mild tofu pudding you might get with a little bit of <laughs> almond flavor. <laughs> but just, just a milliliter of it, right? These were all important life experiences for us, I think. I agree. But finally, just as we're nearing the tree line, we find our plant. And what a glorious plant it is. It's very distinctive, very like thick, solid leaves that look like a bunch of little boobs around, little nipples on them. Um, nothing else looks anything like it. So wait, wait what did we just find? Uh, this is an endemic flower of Haida Gwaii. Um, it's its own genus, Sinus natio. There's no other species in the genus in all of North America. It's common in the alpine of Haida Gwaii, but not found anywhere else in the world. Oh. And why would that be? So this will have survived in a nun attack on Haida Gwaii. So a, a, a small glacier refugia. Um, Haida Gwaii was pretty much all glaciated, but it, because we had our own glaciers here, they're much thinner. So a couple of the mountaintops stuck out, out of the ice and something called a nunatuck, a little space where things could survive in the ice, but only high alpine little things are surviving because they're very small little spots. So there's a variety of different lichens and mosses and a couple of little beetles and uh, alpine plants that survived there. And this is one of them, it didn't survive anywhere else. This wildflower, Sinocinesio newcomii, or Newcomb's butterweed, is one of a number of species only found on Haida Gwaii. It's endemic. Some of these species are also found in another place called the Brooks Peninsula on Vancouver Island. And these two places share a special distinction. During the last ice age, when much of North America and all of what we now know as Canada was covered by kilometers thick sheets of ice, there were at least a few areas here on these remote islands of the westernmost coast, which remained ice free. Where exactly and how large those areas were is still debated, but Newcomb's butterweed and other species like it present irrefutable evidence that nunataks, these little ice-free islands on mountain peaks, existed. So it was worth the hike, right? Definitely. I've learned not to doubt your instincts at this point. Also, it was worth it just to see these beautiful little patches of, of sunshine yellow flowers smiling up at us, reminding us of a time when Nearly everything was covered in ice up here. Well, but not quite everything. Not quite everything. It's beautiful up here. And when we finally made it to the top and got to look out over the archipelago, we saw how the the highest peaks had this incredibly sharp razor-like relief. Unlike the hills below us, which were rolling with all the hard edges ground off by presumably ice sheets as they receded to the north at the end of the last ice age. But we also saw something else. When we looked out to the east, over the Hecate Strait, the 60-some kilometer stretch of ocean that separates Haida Gwaii from the mainland, we knew that somewhere, hundreds of meters under the water, there was probably evidence of a much larger ice-free area that paleobiologists refer to as a glacial refugium. And that has been sort of hypothesized that Haida Gwaii had a glacier refugia. Um, the, the more recent work, showing if there was one, was probably somewhere in the Hecate Strait, because sea level was lower. Um, and the mainland glacier was coming off the mainland, and the Haida Gwaii was coming off Haida Gwaii, and they kind of met in the Hecate, but there was like maybe some large spot in there that was unglaciated. At this point, you're probably wondering what these putative glacial refugias have to do with kelp forests. The answer is that the existence of these ice-free areas, coupled with the existence of these productive kelp-dominated marine ecosystems, these are two critical pieces of evidence to support what has become known as the kelp highway hypothesis for how people first arrived in what we now call the Americas. Ever since Columbus first washed up on the shores of Guanahani Island in what we now call the Bahamas, and identified the people living on it as Indians, well, settlers have been confused about where the indigenous people they were encountering had come from. But indigenous people throughout the Americas have had no such confusion. If you ask Barbara or Charles, who we heard from last episode, 
where their people came from, they'll tell you. My people say we've always been here. There always were people in Kakawa territory. At the same time, both Charles and Barbara are able to hold the truth of this oral history alongside the questions we all share about the deep time origins and diaspora of our species. As a metaphor for origin, it implies that for all the time that people have been culturally human, they've been in this, this space. Uh, and if you look at some of the early, early origin myths, they're all really about, I would argue, about being culturally human. I had an archaeologist, Daryl, say, hmm, 13 years, 14,000 years, that's forever. You know, so we've always been here. We claim we came out of the water and that our ancestors could take their marine outside coats off and hang them up and become ordinary human beings. And when they got hungry, they put them back on again and they went out to the ocean and ate. Okay, that's our story. But for the better part of the past century, archaeologists and anthropologists had a different story. Based on artifacts and evidence they had gathered, they hypothesized that ancient peoples crossed a land bridge that was exposed during the last ice age from eastern Asia to northern Alaska, inhabiting a cold but unglaciated tundra known as Beringia, and surviving by tracking and hunting big game you know, woolly mammoths and mastodons and that kind of thing. Then, about 13 or so thousand years ago, give or take, the ice sheets started to melt and an ice-free corridor opened up between the Cordilleran and Laurentide ice sheets, basically somewhere along the present-day border between the Canadian provinces of British Columbia and Alberta. As the story goes, these big game hunters passed through this corridor and rapidly peopled the entirety of the Americas, from British Columbia down to Patagonia. There are several major flaws that have been exposed in this hypothesis. For one, it ignores the oral traditions of the indigenous peoples it purports to explain. But also, it doesn't explain the highly sophisticated maritime cultures that are evidenced all along the Pacific coast, with some sites dating back to 14,000 years ago or even earlier. So let's just let's just do a kind of conceptual thing. So we trudge across the Bering Land Bridge chasing large animals. We work our way down the ice-free corridor. We somehow turn around and work our way out to the coast up and then we develop an extensive maritime culture. <laughs> I don't know. I think there's some gaps there. So a new explanation often referred to as the Kelp Highway Hypothesis, has now gained broad acceptance, the idea being that the Americas were peopled, at least in part, by these mobile, ocean-going peoples that paddled from Asia all the way to Patagonia in an arc around the perimeter of the Pacific. Living off the abundance of kelp-associated ecosystems and camping out in these hypothesized ice-free areas, possibly as early as 20,000 years ago or more. One thing we're not going to do in this episode is make any kind of definitive statement about the peopling of the Americas. There are so many peoples and so many stories, so many possibilities, including long distance canoe travel by Pacific Islanders, or even theories that involve ancient peoples crossing the Atlantic. But we are in love with the idea that kelp ecosystems have played such a profound role in the deep time origins of coastal peoples and that these ecosystems are still so important to us today. In fact, we're in love with kelp ecosystems in general. So in this final episode of our series on kelp worlds, we're taking you to Guayhanas, the islands of beauty, to explore how people who love these ecosystems, Haida, scientists, commercial divers, and podcast listeners alike, can work together so that when sea otters return to our shores, we'll be ready. We're calling this episode In the Balance. Hawa for listening. Broadcasting from the unceded, shared, and asserted territories of the Penelicut, Huitzum, and other Halkomenum speaking peoples, this is Future Ecologies, where your hosts, Adam Huggins and Mendel Skalski, explore the shape of our world through ecology, design, and sound.
When we washed up on the shores of Haida Gwaii last summer, the first thing we did was head over to the Haida Heritage Center. No, the first thing we did was gorge ourselves on the thousands of ripe thimbleberries <laughs> literally lining the streets of Queen Charlotte. Yeah, that's actually much more accurate. <laughs> yeah, it was basically heaven. The streets of heaven are aligned with fruit, not gold. <laughs> yeah, but we digress. The second thing we did was head over to the Haida Heritage Center, also known as the Kai Center, where a truly magical thing happened. A very nice young lady working there, aptly named Hannah Friegen, offered us a rare treat. Okay, um, what, what are we about to try? Gao. What is Gao? It is herring roe on kelp, giant kelp. Attentive listeners may remember Gao from Barbara's waxing on kelp as food. Not just in its own right, but also as a substrate for herring to lay their delicious eggs on. Unfortunately, though... Uh, where is the Gao from? <laughs> it's from Bella Bella, actually. Um, we don't have a lot of kelp around our waters here, so um, a few guys every year bring up gal uh, and sell it to us. Yep. Well, because we can't harvest it um, a lot here. This is due in part to declines in herring populations due to overfishing, which, as we've said previously, we hope to talk about in the future. But it's also just due to a general lack of kelp. We just don't have enough kelp for them to uh, lay their eggs on the kelp. So they lay their eggs elsewhere, but just we don't have enough kelp to harvest them on. So yeah. right. That's interesting. So yeah. they, you think there would be a lot more cow if there was a lot more kelp? Yes. Yeah. That sobering knowledge did not stop us, dear listeners, from chowing down. It's like having bouncy balls in your mouth. <laughs> Jump in there, get some. You can have as much as you want, I'm sure. <laughs> it's got a good flavor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely one of my favorite foods. Mm-hmm. I like how the first two things we do involve <laughs> eating. It's very on brand. Well, on Haida Gwaii, we sampled thimbleberries, and cloudberries, and crowberries, and salmon berries, and gao, and gudingai. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah, that's also on brand. <laughs> <laughs> So, coming back to Gao, the knowledge that there wasn't enough kelp or herring left in Haida waters to support a Gao fishery stuck with us as we set out early the next morning to explore Guaihanas, which means islands of beauty in Haida, and essentially refers to the southern half of the archipelago. We were part of a media expedition organized by Parks Canada. That's right. Yours truly. We, humble podcasters, are now officially card-carrying members of the media establishment. We've made the big time. The big time, in this case, involved an early morning ferry ride from the island metropolis of Queen Charlotte across to Sandspit, which is more or less like it sounds, followed by... A long ride in a van stuffed with journalists and Parks Canada employees. So we got an hour and a half of this. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Minus the 10 minutes we've been going. Anyhow, the van dropped us off at the head of Kamshwa Inlet, which you might remember is where Barbara Wilson is from. And there, we suited up, piled into a Zodiac, and set off on our journey, led by our fearless captain, Ollie Popley. As soon as we get underway, though, we pass through Louise Narrows, a small channel in between two much larger islands, and it forces us to slow down to a crawl. This gives Ollie a moment to tell us a little bit more about Guaihanas, because depending on who you ask, you'll either hear it called Guaihanas, or you'll hear... It's the Guaihanas National Park Reserve, Haida Heritage Site, and Marine Conservation Area Reserve. Good God, what a mouthful. And the reserve part is really important because um, it indicates that relationship between the Council of the Hyde Nation and the Government of Canada. And it basically shows that they both agree to disagree upon who owns it. Um, But what they do agree on is that it should be looked after. From the minute we set foot on Haida Gwaii, we could tell there was something different about this place. 
Almost all of British Columbia is the unceded territory of one or sometimes several First Nations, not to mention the rest of Canada or North America, which one could frame as anything from covered by treaty to expropriated by legalistic obfuscation to just plain stolen. But Haida Gwaii just feels different. It, it feels as though in this one far-flung place, Canada and the Haida have settled on a temporary truce over who the land belongs to. Which is a polite way to say that everyone recognizes that the land belongs to the Haida Nation and has since forever. But that the government of Canada is trying to maintain a legitimate presence there while treaty negotiations are underway. It sounds tense, and I'm sure at the negotiating table it can be. But out on the land and water, it feels kind of miraculous. Like an actual living, breathing example of co-management of ecosystems that draws on the strengths of two very different cultures. Within the reserve, ecosystems are protected from mountaintop to the seafloor, with 100% of the land protected from logging and other extraction, and 42% of the water protected from commercial fishing, with the entirety of the reserve open to Haida traditional use. So whether you call it Guayhanas, or the Guayhanas National Park Reserve, National Marine Conservation Area Reserve, and Haida Heritage Site. It sets a powerful precedent for the way ahead. And that's in, in part why we're here. But as we emerge from the Louise Narrows and shoot out into more open water, Lyle Island comes into view in the distance. And as we approach, we're reminded that this spirit of cooperation wasn't always here. In the 1970s, logging practices on Haida Gwaii, then known as the Queen Charlotte Islands, were like logging practices pretty much everywhere else in BC. Unsustainable at best, destructive at worst. By 1985, after a decade worth of nation-to-nation -nation negotiations to try and protect the area now known as Guayanas, a local logging outfit headed by a man named Frank Beben was preparing to move in and clear-cut an important cultural and ecological area called Windy Bay on Athligwai, or Lyle Island. What happened next was nothing short of historic, and to tell the tale, here's Haida elder and living legend, Captain Gold. So we uh, had a quick emergency meeting in the fall in 1985. Buddy was asking people that attended the meeting, he said, what do you people think? He's ready to get into Windy Bay, what are we going to do? He's looking for kind of directions, I guess you could call it. So right away we all said, enough is enough. We've got to move now. we got to stand behind our word. All those things like that you could hear from people. So the word was out, we're going to stop logging, we're going to stop a bevin. In October of 1985, Captain Gold and a group of young Haida head down to Windy Bay to occupy the cut block and make a stand. So we started organizing, pulled together a building crew and uh, who are the cooks and who are the volunteers and <laughs> the first building to go up was a cookhouse and then the second one was the honeymoon shack which is a bathhouse, <laughs> and then the other one was a snake pit, we called it, which is where everybody gets from uh, all over. I did, we're coming in, come in, spend the night, and go up on the line the next day and get arrested, and shipped off. Another group comes in, so that's why we're calling it the snake pit. <laughs> what, a, what a place it was, it was so powerful. We heard that Frank Bevin's going to go to logging the next day. So we asked the ladies in the camp to leave us, and all the men stood in the room, joined hands. Then we started prayers, and uh, then we started Haida singing. It was pretty powerful for a lot of us in the way that uh, we all expected to be away for two years. So we were making arrangements with some people about how to look after our affairs when we're gone. And uh, the ladies outside were waiting. So we invited them back in and they said they were moved to tears to hear us singing. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> because we were all singing in one big group. The next day, because I was the oldest one, I went up there. They elected me to be in front of the line. No use taking pictures at that point. <laughs> we all expected to be all the way. And then all of a sudden, they could hear the chopper coming. And it turned out to be the five elders that stepped off the chopper right in front of us. That in my role, I went back to taking pictures <laughs> and recording. Everybody is so happy to see them. No time at all. We had a little shelter on the road and the fire and little blocks of wood for the elders to sit on. <laughs> and that started everything from there. It is a very emotional night because that first day they showed up, no other logger showed up at that point. We waited all day. So we all went down and we had supper and all that. And then the elders were very, very strong in their position. We are going to be the first ones to be arrested. And we tried to talk them out of it. And they wouldn't listen. They, they were wanting to go. <laughs> so they said the elders anyhow told uh, us the reason why that the rest of the world seeing us getting arrested standing up for our rights in uh, Haida Gwaii is going to be a very strong message to the rest of the world. Last Wednesday morning, a group of Haida came to Sedgwick Bay on Lyle Island to protect this lifestyle. You're breaking the law and you're stopping us from going to work and we ask you to step aside and let us continue. There will be no logging on the area that the Haida people have designated as not to be touched. This is Haida land and there'll be no further logging in this area. And then everybody else started getting arrested after that. <laughs> the arrests continued until winter, and the loggers eventually backed off. This victory precipitated a series of events that would result in the protection of the southern archipelago and the creation, in 1993, of Guayanas. Long story short, Guayanas didn't just come to be on its own. It's the result of generations of Haida continually asserting their sovereignty, putting their bodies on the line, and using every tool at their disposal to defend their lands and waters and protect their culture. And to give credit to the good folks at Parks Canada, the relationship that has been built between Haida scientists and park staff, I'm sure it has its challenges, but it appears on the whole to be genuinely positive. And its roots go back a good three decades before reconciliation became a buzzword. We are about to arrive at float camp. So we'll have to move on for the time being. But this won't be the last we'll hear from Captain Gold in this episode or on this podcast. So, in just the first half of this episode, we've talked deglaciation, coastal migration, cut block occupation, and reconciliation. Woo! <laughs> but as our little zodiac makes its way south through the waves and the fog and the occasional driving rain, the sun miraculously comes out from behind the clouds and we round a corner into a sheltered cove for a very welcome sight. There's a series of floating buildings connected together to form a laboratory and field station. We see some distant figures on board waving and beckoning us over, and we are very happy to be pulled in. Hey! Hello! Hi! We're just fashionably late. I know, we tried to call you. Adam, in particular, was happy to come ashore. I think it's safe to say he is definitely not a sailor. <laughs> it's good to have legs. Uh, it's just a feel them. <laughs> and we were delighted to see a familiar face. Good to see you again after all. Good to see you too. This is Dr. Lynn Lee, and it was her presentation at a conference I attended last year that set this whole series into motion. 
Hey, my name is Lynn Lee, and I am the marine ecologist at Guayanas National Park Reserve, National Marine Conservation Area Reserve, and Haida Heritage Site. Um, I'm the technical lead for the Chihu Til Inestel project, which is um, Haida for nurturing seafood to grow. Which is basically what we'd come here to see. How exactly Lynn and her team are nurturing seafood to grow, in a nutshell. How about uh, in an urchin test? Nice. Just testing it out. Essentially, we're mimicking sea otter foraging without for, without foraging on abalone. So we're selectively foraging on the super heavy duty grazer, the lawnmower sea urchin, but we're not eating abalone. <laughs> and the and the goal there is to it's to restore kelp forests and also to improve abalone habitat because of the indirect benefits of kelp forest forests for abalone. Because they're known, like if you have abalone in a kelp forest, they're they've been shown to have a different size structure than those that are outside the kelp forest. So cool. So much work. Right. So I guess we should unpack that. In the simplest terms, as we learned in episode one, without sea otters to eat them, sea urchins basically clear-cut kelp forests. So remove the urchins yourself, and presto, kelp. No sea otters required. Lots of interns required. But in this case, they've actually partnered with the Haida and with commercial urchin divers, so a little less work. But Still, a lot of work. So basically, they chose two sites that were both urchin barrens. Like, you don't see it when you just look at an urchin barren, but there's always kelp settling. So, but as soon as it settles, then the urchin comes and gobbles it up. And in one of those sites, they send a team of divers in to literally grab every visible urchin. And basically, just crush them with this specialized tool they had to buy from Japan. The Japanese love their uni. <laughs> oh, me too. And after all the urchins within the area are gone, that's it. They resurface and just watch and wait. And if their hypothesis is correct, then the area they treated should become a kelp forest within a matter of months, while their control area, where they didn't remove any urchins, should remain an urchin barren. It's a pretty simple and elegant experiment. Yeah, so we, uh, the initial urchin cull started in September of 2018, and then the, uh, the larger uh, cull happened in March of 2019. So the urchin harvesters came out and helped clear thousands and thousands of urchins from that three-kilometer stretch. This is Lynn's colleague, Dan, who is focusing on the urchin side of the equation. Yeah, my name's Dan Okamoto. I'm an assistant professor of biological science at Florida State University. It's a long way to come to bust some urchins. He's committed. But what's really cool about Dan's work is that he's studying the urchins to see if restoring the kelp forest, like, does that transition from urchin barren to kelp forest benefit the urchins, even though by necessity, there would have to be a lot less of them for it to happen. And uh, one of the questions is, is, if you restore a kelp forest, does that actually have much of an impact on their diet? Does that have an impact on their growth rates? And so one of the chemical analyses we're doing is taking tissue samples and we can use fatty acid analysis to look at the different fatty acid compounds that are in those tissues that are incorporated from their food sources and then do the same thing with their food sources and we can try to understand if there's, is there a shift as you recover a kelp forest and there's lots of other different kinds of food around, how does that shift and how does that compare to the areas that haven't been impacted? This is kind of a, a complicated way of saying, you are what you eat, urchins, and so we're going to study what you eat, and see how that changes in a kelp forest versus an urchin barren. And they're using fatty acids because they provide a really detailed index for what the urchins are eating over time. Dan's student Nate explained this really well. Because you get kind of the time integrated um, value, um, as opposed to seeing, oh, that's what they're eating right now. Or you take it one step better and you take maybe their gut contents and you say, well, that's what's in your stomach. But just because I found a cheeseburger in your stomach <laughs> today. yesterday, today, it doesn't mean you eat cheeseburgers every day. So what? it's kind of a, yeah. <laughs> so it's just a kind of a cool way to um, see what, you know, on average, what they've been eating over time. Also, if you've ever cracked open an urchin, the test is basically hollow and filled with their food and digestive juices. It's kind of gross. <laughs> They're quite inefficient. Yeah. So generally, the, you know, it's almost like their poop looks like what, they're, what they <laughs> ate in smaller form. Right. <laughs> so they don't have full results yet because they're still doing the research. 
But one thing they have shown, by putting urchins in these cool chambers that measure gas exchange and temperature, other things like that, is that urchins and urchin barons essentially go dormant metabolically. Like, they, they go into hibernation or something like it. We measure the metabolism and urchins from urchin barons just shut down. It's kind of this cool observation. Uh, they basically they're in deep just, meditation. Uh, they're in de- a deep <laughs> meditative state. No, they're, so they're not responsive. <laughs> so I mean, they are. Yeah. So they are. Like, measure, like, very, it's a breathing rate. Yeah. 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 So there's a, a respiration rate that these chambers are measuring. So you put individual, you can see them. Uh, Nate's just going to run the experiment, but you put an individual urchin into the chamber and then it's hooked up to things that measure the gas content. And then you can tell how much it's used, breathing essentially in the water. And so the ones that they're getting from the kelp line, which is where all the food is, have a much higher metabolic rate than the ones that are down low where there's no food. The urchins down deep, they also can be voracious. So that's plenty sufficient to suppress any new growth. Right, so they're, we call them zombies. They're just in this state where there's not much row. Somehow they're still there. <laughs> I've kept urchins alive in the lab for a year, for up to a year without feeding them. It's not very nice, but it happens. Did, did you give up or did they die? Uh, I had to graduate from my future. <laughs> <laughs> so these herds of zombie urchins can live together with almost no food, nearly indefinitely, which explains why, without sea otters or very, very committed scientists wielding Japanese urchin-crushing tools, kelp forests can't really come back on their own. And then Dan and Lynn told us something totally wild. Remember those atomic bomb tests on Amchitka back in the 60s and 70s? Researchers have been able to identify trace amounts of radioactive material from those nuclear tests inside of urchin tests, allowing them to determine that the large red sea urchin so common off our coast can be over 100 or even up to 200 years old. Some may be old enough to have been a wee pluteus when sea otters were still around, before they were hunted into local extinction, which kind of blew Adam's mind. Like, I was just thinking about the urchins, and it's like, if those urchins are 100 to 200 years old, like, it's an old growth forest in a sense, like an old growth animal ecosystem. An urchin zombie forest? Yeah, an old growth urchin (laughs) zombie graveyard. I don't know what to call it. It just struck me in that moment that the so-called forests of bull kelp we're trying to revive here are short-lived ecosystems in a sense. Like, they can be stable over decades, but the bull kelp itself is just an annual species. It grows and reproduces and dies each year and it has to do it again the next year. Even the oldest kelps only live a few decades at most. And yet, urchin barons can be composed of some individuals that are hundreds of years old, making them old growth by any definition. Zombies are not. But even though kelps themselves are short-lived, the ecosystems they create are ancient and full of life, and probably overall a better place for urchins to live in. And you can't make a kelp forest without cracking a few urchins. Speaking of which, we couldn't move on from the topic of urchins without sampling some of Dan's specimens. As we mentioned previously, The edible parts are actually the urchin's gonads, which on a healthy, that is, non-zombie urchin, are arrayed in these juicy crescents around the inside of the test. We started with a large red one. So you want one that's full, that's healthy, that's well-fed, lots of lipid content. Um, And they're really, really sweet if they're fat and happy. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Oh my god, I love it. And then we tried one of the diminutive, but numerous, green urchins. So the greens are far more consistent and generally tend to be sweeter. So people prefer them, so... Oh, that's even sweeter than the red ones. Mm. That is so good. Oh. But before we could get to the purple sea urchins, we realized that Dan had more than just urchins hiding in those chambers of his. Yeah, so we're trying to keep him happy with some of the kelp here. These are kind of little guys, but yeah. So these are endangered, right? 
this um, is the northern abalone, right? This is northern abalone. This is the pinto abalone. And they eat basically all sorts of um, they eat kelp, they eat stuff that's growing on the rocks. And so the idea is that as you remove a bunch of sea urchins, you get a bunch of kelp coming back. In theory, that might help boost abalone populations, um, increase their growth rates, increase their reproduction, increase their survival. And then Lynn brought one out to show us. Oh, there, you can see this one's coming out. So the eye stalks are coming out. You can see the little black spots there. So yeah, so they can see light and dark. And there's its head. They're actually the fastest snail in the West. <laughs> I like to tell people that little fun fact. A dubious distinction. Yeah, dubious distinction. But they do move quite fast when they're running away from predators. Oh, this guy's really performing. This is awesome. Northern abalone are more beautiful and active than I had ever imagined more so even than their lustrous shells had suggested. Picture a large, dark, totally flattened slug, encircled by this border of fringed epipodia, known as a skirt. It has little eye stalks and a radula for grazing on the head, and the entire thing is topped with a flat shell that has an arc of holes in it, which they use for all the things. Yeah, everything. So they breathe through the holes, they spawn through the holes, they... <laughs> the holes are useful. I was so taken aback by how charismatic this little sea snail was that I couldn't resist. Do you mind? No, not at all. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, isn't that cool? It's that kind is of a cool such feeling. a cool sensation. Yeah. What we're to find out. So you just let it go and don't disturb it. <laughs> isn't that cool? The closest thing I can describe is like a goats eating out of your hands, you know? <laughs> that I have not done before. <laughs> oh, yeah? Oh, that one's crawling. pretty cooperative. I think this abalone wants to be your friend. I I want to take this abalone <laughs> home with me. You may not take your abalone home, I'm sorry. <laughs> and of course, I had to get in there too. <laughs> wow. Isn't that awesome? Yes, awesome is the word for this. Oh my gosh. You will have been rarely blessed by an abalone. <laughs> they can just articulate their shells oh, yeah. so, so this much. This is really cool too, this shell twisting action. So when they're trying to get away, so imagine you're a sunflower star and your two feet are coming up and you grab the abalone. Right. So one of its escape responses is to twist back and forth really vigorously and then it can pop the two feet loose and then it can start to run. Defensive action. Mm -hmm. So cool. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, just like that. This is where the medium of podcasting fails us. But this energetic little abalone flexes its foot when it's alarmed, and it twists its shell above itself in a helicopter motion. It's actually really strong. When we first started talking to Lynn and Dan, it was hard to imagine doing all of this work just to help a snail make a comeback. But that little snail stole our hearts. And unlike most things on Haida Gwaii, we didn't even get to taste it. No. Instead, we put our wetsuits on, jumped back in the boat, and went out to see the research sites. Oh my god. Oh my god. Isn't it beautiful? Where's my goggles at? Did it's so beautiful. No, I didn't take it. my arm. <laughs> oh. uh, could you describe what we're looking at? Okay, so we are sitting in the northeast side of Murchison Island, and that's right in our restoration site. We have two permanent um, sample plots where we run transect lines here. And what you're looking at is all the new kelp growth since we have removed the urchins. Hey, and what does it look like to you? Um, so it's a lush um, bull kelp forest canopy that extends out from shore, probably about five to 10 meters. Um, previous to the restoration work, we maybe had a couple of plants against the shoreline. So this is like a really big increase in the canopy that has happened since we did the restoration work this spring. Wow, so how long has it been there? Um, so between nine and three months, three to nine months, all this kelp has uh, grown back, which is pretty phenomenal. So we're really excited. I, I'm really curious, why did you choose this site to be your test plot? Uh, well, we had two purposes for this. We wanted to improve abalone habitat. So we wanted places where abalone was, uh, were living. Um, and so this is a good place for abalone and we also wanted to be on a rocky shore where there was already potential for good kelp forests to come back and so this is part of the reason we chose the site. 
So I hope you guys enjoy your circle oh. because the sunlight is streaming through and you should be able to see lots of fish swimming in there. I'm so looking forward to it. I'm really excited. <laughs> I think you should just like get your stuff off and jump in the water. Sounds good. <laughs> What's so quiet? <laughs> I'm not sure how to communicate about that time in the water, except to say that the sun was shining and these 20 foot tall stipes of bull kelp were so thick in the water that we got tangled up in them. And there were these huge basketball sized fried egg jellyfish that were swimming around in there and they didn't really sting. So you could just put your hand on them and kind of dribble them like like they were uh, basketballs or something. It was so dense that you wouldn't even see them until you got right on top of them. The, the kelp is so much thicker and, and stronger than I expected. It was a lot more like like climbing than like swimming. It was so magical. We weren't able to dive down to the bottom where we could see all these schools of fish um, and kelp crabs floating on the fronds. It was just so easy to imagine that instead of this little patch, that there could and should be extensive underwater forests like this all along the coast. Well, let's just say we've become true believers. We also got to swim in their control site, which was similar, except that they hadn't removed any urchins. So there was literally no kelp at all. And it looked like a bunch of urchins hanging out and, and not doing too much. Pretty docile for a zombie horde, all things considered. And that, that's not to suggest that nothing of ecological or human value is happening in that urchin barren. But we both definitely had this immediate, visceral reaction of joy in that kelp forest. And I'm honestly still carrying it to this day. When we got back in the boat, shivering because the Pacific Ocean is as cold as it is exciting, we may or may not have spent the rest of the afternoon soaking in the fabled pools of Hot Spring Island, just across the way. But that's for us to know, and you to imagine. Now, I hate to burst this bubble, but in case any of you were wondering, the methods Lynn and Dan and their team of Haida and commercial fishermen are employing to bring back the kelp forests and the abalone, they're straightforward and effective, but probably impossible to replicate at scale. I followed up with Jim Estes, the father of kelp forest ecology who you heard in episode one, and asked him point blank if he thought kelp forests on the coast could be restored in this manner, without otters. You want a real frank answer? I'm pissing against the tide. I mean, God, no, I don't think so. So no, I think going out there with hammers and whatever all they're doing and killing urchins, I mean, it does show a process, but as a management tool to try to recover that system to a kelp dominated system, I, it seems it, it seems silly to me. I just cannot imagine that, uh, you know, it would take such a vast effort. So I think if you want that system to be a kelp dominated system, uh, which a lot of people do because they value kelp as habitat for other species and so on and so forth, uh, you're probably going to have to get the full complement of interactors back that make it kelpy. I want it more kelpy. One more vote for kelpy. <laughs> vote for kelpy. <laughs> vote for kelpy. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. Uh, and to be clear, Jim's not criticizing the Guayhanas experiment at all. He's aware of it and he's, he's following the research. He's just acknowledging that the methods aren't practical at scale. You need to have sea otters or other urchin predators in the system to make it kelpy in the long run. So why do this experiment at all? Well, there is something we haven't told you yet. The official Guayanas crest, the logo you see everywhere on Parks Canada materials and on signs around Guayanas, is of a sea otter. 
floating on its back with an urchin balanced on its belly. And just a reminder, there still aren't any established sea otter populations in the waters around Haida Gwaii, and there haven't been for over 200 years. We were curious about this, and so naturally, we asked Captain Gold about it. Uh, get Kinjus, Chief Get Kinjus, Ron Wilson. It's a beautiful image, done in the Northwest Coast style by Haida artist Kikinja, Ron Wilson. And according to Captain Gold, Kikinja came to him to ask his advice on what to do. He said, I'm stuck. He said, I can't think of how to make this logo, something like that. And uh, I said, just think. I said, what represented the wealth of Guayanas of South Boise? It's the sea otter. And he, you picture him laying on his back as though he's always in the ocean. And what food is he always eating? The sea urchin. I said, do you remember the sun? And it looked just like the sea urchin with all the spikes and whatnot. That's, that's a rays of the sun. So he did that design. And that became the logo. In many ways, the crest is both a reminder of what's been lost, and also it feels somehow aspirational. Like, this could be the reality in the near future. Because sea otters have successfully reestablished themselves in and around Vancouver Island, the central coast of BC, southeast Alaska. Haida Gwaii is surrounded, and most scientists now agree that it's only a matter of time before sea otters form viable populations on Haida Gwaii. It could really happen any time. And people do occasionally see wandering males scoping out new territory. For years, I watched a sea otter down at Skungwai. Never said a word to anybody. And I seen another one recently in a different place. But I kept mum about that too. And uh, you find them here and there slowly starting to come back. The reason that Captain Gold tends to keep these observations to himself is that many Haida and commercial fishermen are afraid that if the sea otters return, then they'll eat all the seafood, and there won't be anything left for people. And that's not an unreasonable fear. As we learned in our last episode, from talking to Kiiljus and Anne, it's already happened to the new Chanoff on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And they keep using that as a picture. If we allow sea otters to come back, it'll be like Vancouver Island. The central question here is, once the sea otters return, will it be possible to strike a balance between making things kelpie again and having enough food to support the otters, but also preserving and maybe even enhancing people's ability to sustainably harvest seafoods? The abalone isn't the only important food, but it's sort of the canary in the coal mine here. And the funny thing about abalone, right, is one of these things where otters will come through, and they'll eat the urchins, and kelp forests will come back, but otters also love abalone. Sure. So it's one of those trade-offs, right, it's where you can recover the, you might be able to help the kelp harp, um, populations, but basically it's a double whammy, like these guys are kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. They've got a dominant competitor that eats their food source, and they've got a dominant predator that eats both of them. The health of its populations are an indicator for the balance that we as people would want to strike. So much so that when the Haida and Parks Canada got together to articulate a set of guiding principles for caring for Guayhanas, they chose abalone to represent balance. The sea otters may return sooner, or they may return later, but if abalone can't be preserved, then we still haven't found that right balance. As we made our way back from float camp to town, we stopped at Windy Bay on Athlete Gwai, also known as Lyle Island. This is the watershed that Captain Gold and the Haida formed a blockade in the 1980s to defend, and it's full of these incredible, huge, old-growth trees. There's also a longhouse there, and next to it, the Legacy Pole, which was raised in 2013 to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the Guayhanas Agreement. 
We'd been traveling this whole time with these two young Haida women, Crystal and Cheyenne, who were also working for Parks Canada that summer. See in the middle there? They sat down to tell us the story that the legacy poll was made to communicate. Is uh, the three watchmen. And it's in to honor all those watching over uh, Guayanas in the past and future. It, it struck us that these young Haida in Parks Canada uniforms were themselves emblematic of this remarkable agreement of cross-cultural cooperation and co-management guided by a, a set of shared values that feels very open-ended. And, on the other side, and then, the as they wrapped up, we noticed that there were abalone shells literally embedded into the legacy pole. It seems that everywhere we go, there is abalone. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it definitely um, in our guiding principles um, that Guayanas was set out to have. Uh, the abalone is to represent a balance between uh, the interactions, I guess, between the natural, supernatural, and then also between like well, the I land and sea. Have you guys uh, tasted abalone or has it always been protected? It's always been protected. Since I was born, at least. Mm -hmm. Which is, how old are you guys? 20. 20. Both. Yeah. Hong. It's striking to think about the cultural and ecological significance of abalone. How present they are in the art and, and culture and oral history of the Haida and, and other coastal people. And yet, how absent they are from the ocean and from the diets of this new generation. When I hear Captain Gold say something like, It's so late for a lot of things in our world, traditional foods. I really start to understand what is meant by calling the Guayanas Project nurturing seafood to grow. And for Lynn, who's been studying this system in Guayanas, the way to do that is pretty clear. Well, my perspective is that the return of sea otters is a chance to restore traditional harvest of sea otters and traditional harvest of abalone and kelp beds. So to restore that balance of people using the ecosystem in ways that they had before. So it's in, those, in the areas where sea otters have come back, where there's been no hunting, then you get the other extreme of the ecosystem too, which is different than what it was in the past when people were also actively hunting sea otters throughout the coast. So we've bumped it to like a total other end of the spectrum with letting sea otters uh, survive and grow and exponential growth rates as much as they can with no predation, no human predation, which was part of the system and was part of actively part of the system. So my perspective here is that sea otters are they're very polarizing in the community. So there's some people who want to shoot them as soon as they see them and other people who recognize that they benefit kelp forests and benefit the ecosystem. And so there are two camps. But ultimately, I think we're going to get to the point where otters come back, they reestablish, and they'll reestablish a hunt as well, when there's enough that you can have a hunt. Captain Gold is on the same page. And the uh, sea otter and everything else is one that likes to eat uh, abalone, and we like to eat it in a way that if we control both we keep them for the future. And that's basically a lot of the things that we did in our in our cycle of life. But with the Ministry of Forest, uh, Fisheries and whatnot, commercializing all the food, we're li we don't have it, there's no balance. We get fined if we even look at it. <laughs> so we have to convince Ministry of Fisheries and whatnot that we need to harvest, we have to harvest, in order to try to keep that balance. Harvest the sea otter. Yep. And so, for now, Lynn and Dan will continue to study the effects of sea otters, without any sea otters, and with an eye to how to help the abalone bounce back. And the Haida, and scientists, and Parks Canada will be watching closely for the sea otter to return. When it does, we will be watching Guayanas. Because given the deep time role of Haida Gwai as a hub on the Kelp Highway, given its unique cultural and political landscape, and the unprecedented level of cooperation between Parks Canada and the Haida Nation in stewarding Guayanas, we think that it's possible that this is the place where allowing the ecosystem to be kelpy doesn't mean depriving people of their traditional foods. In neighboring Alaska, certain native hunters are allowed to hunt sea otters under a very restricted set of conditions. 
which has opened a door to management. But practically speaking, it's a drop in the bucket and hardly an ecosystem level plan. Many commercial harvesters in Alaska continue to call for a bounty on sea otters. Meanwhile, many conservation groups continue to outright oppose any hunting of sea otters. For them, it's a non-starter. So as we draw this series to a close, we're just as unsure as anyone of exactly what the right balance of sea otters and sea urchins and abalone and all the mizu predators like sunflower stars, which we didn't even get to talk about, not to mention human beings, what that right balance is. And it's almost surely gonna vary from place to place on the coast. But looking back into deep time, the Haida and other coastal peoples were clearly able to strike this balance. So we're pretty sure that indigenous peoples and scientists like the ones you've heard over the past three episodes, working together, are the best guides here. And what we're hearing is that, paradoxically, to bring the abalone back, we need to bring the sea otters back. But to bring the sea otters back, we need to be able to hunt them and keep them out of some areas. And to be able to hunt them, we need, in essence, the whole approach to the protection of endangered species to shift, at least where keystone species like sea otters are concerned. It's a tall order, but it's how we're going to conclude this series. And since everyone knows that it ain't over until the kelp horn blows, we're going to ask Ollie to play us out. So wait, what are, what are, what are, what are we hearing here? Uh, this is the kelp horn. The, the full kelp. <laughs> full kelp horn. Okay. <laughs> It's a, very, it's a very sick elephant. Thanks for listening. This episode and the Kelp World's miniseries of Future Ecologies was produced by myself, Adam Huggins. And me, Mendel Skolsky. We covered so much ground and water, and yet there's still so much more to talk about. From the recent spread of urchin barrens in Northern California, to the effects of sea star wasting disease on kelps and the extinction of the stellar sea cow. Are you all kelped out? Or are you hungry for more next season? Vote for Kelpie. Any votes for Kelpie? Let us know how you're feeling, if you made it with us to the end, at futureecologies.net. In this episode, you heard Captain Gold, Kailjus Barbara Wilson, Lynn Lee, Dan Okamoto, Anne Solomon, Charles Menzies, Nate Spindle, Ollie Popley, Crystal Young, Cheyenne Sawyer, Hannah Freegan, Stu Crawford, Jen Chow, and Yero. You can find more information about the Nurturing Seafood to Grow project on Guayhanas' website. You can find pictures from the trip and all sorts of links and citations and tidbits on our website, futureecologies.net. And you can find journalist Jason Goldman's excellent piece on this topic in the online publications Biographic and The Narwhal. We'll be back next month. Please rate and review Future Ecologies wherever podcasts can be found. It helps a lot, and we always like to know what you have to say. Special thanks to Miranda Page and Parks Canada, Chloe Clarkson, Winnie Sai, Ollie, Stu, Jen, and Yero, Leanne Fenwick, and Kieran Wake without all of whom this adventure would never have been possible. Seriously, thank you. Also, an extra special thanks to Riley Byrne over at Podigy for cleaning up all of our totally messy field recordings. Also, thanks to Nate for lending me a wetsuit. Music in this episode was produced by the Hot Sugar Band, Anna Andros, Ben Hamilton, Hildegard's Ghost, and Sunfish Moonlight. If you like what we're doing and you want to help make it happen, you can support us on Patreon. Pay what you can to get access to bonus monthly mini-episodes, extended interviews, stickers, patches, and more. This season, I'm guiding a tour of mushrooms and the kingdom fungi. Join the party. Head over to patreon.com slash future ecologies. You can get in touch with us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and iNaturalist. The handle is always future ecologies. 
You can find a full list of musical credits, show notes, and links on our website, futureecologies.net. Thanks for listening. Cool. That's it. I'm stopping this.